Mechanical conditioning versus mechanical ventilation. I have always found mechanical ventilation to be a really difficult topic. I've just been in the enclosure design world for so long that mechanical systems seem just impenetrably difficult. But what finally unlocked the topic for me turned out to actually be fairly straightforward. This isn't to diminish the complexity of mechanical systems design, but the distinction between mechanical conditioning and mechanical ventilation is particularly useful for architects in working with mechanical systems designers to provide the right fit between the enclosure and the mechanical system design that creates the, the type of interior environment that they desire, rather than just hoping it all works out. So let's take a look at a typical cold climate house with a basement and two stories above grade. It has an air handler that controls temperature. Supply ducts provide conditioned air, either heated or cooled, to the space inside. And return ducts take air from the space and deliver it back to the air handler so that it can be conditioned. Now what we have is a closed system. It's just a loop. We're not providing new exterior fresh air into the space. We're just heating or cooling what's already there. Let's look at a single story warm climate house. We've got a similar setup there as well. There's an air handler that controls temperature, supply ducts provide conditioned air, heated or cooled to the space, and return ducts take air from the space and deliver it back to the air handler so that it can be conditioned. Just like our cold climate house, it's a closed system. Note one important difference though, the warm climate house has the air handler and the distribution system, the ducts, outside of the thermal enclosure. They're in the attic, which is usually vented, so they're effectively outside. Anyway, in both cases, the thermostat controls temperature, only temperature. It does not control ventilation, but we're not suffocating inside. Even when we're not opening any windows, fresh air gets inside somehow. How? Now, incidentally, we're also not controlling humidity, at least not deliberately. Interior relative humidity is affected when we monkey around with the temperature, and um, that's outside the scope of this video. For now, just notice that we're not currently doing anything to independently control relative humidity. We just control temperature. We design new homes a little bit differently now, and we'll get to that, but lots and lots of homes still work just like this. There's a good chance that the home you grew up in worked exactly like this, and it's a helpful place for us to start. Okay, but back to our problem of fresh air. So how does exterior air get into our buildings for us to breathe? To understand that, we're gonna have to understand what causes air to move from one place to another. Air moves due to pressure differences. It always moves from areas of higher pressure to areas of lower pressure. But what causes these kinds of pressure differences? In buildings, we're dealing with wind, temperature differences, and mechanically induced pressures. For airflow to occur between two points, there must be both a pathway or an opening connecting those two points and an air pressure difference. So both of these conditions must exist. If we have a pathway or a connection but no pressure differences, we won't have airflow. And if we have a pressure difference but no pathway, we won't have airflow either. Although, practically speaking, it's very difficult in building design to eliminate or perfectly seal all pathways. And actually, not only is it very difficult to eliminate these pathways, it's really pretty difficult to even understand them. The pathways themselves are complex because our walls, roofs, and foundations are made up of all kinds of materials creating these three-dimensional airflow networks within them. As difficult and unpredictable as pressure seems, it's often easier to understand because we can measure pressure, we can't even see a lot of our pathways. So pressure differences are generated by wind, temperature, and mechanical equipment. We're not gonna talk much about wind and temperature in this discussion, except to note that both are hard to predict and cannot be controlled. We don't have an on-off switch for these things. The third way to create pressure differences in buildings is to mechanically induce them. 
The most popular mechanically induced pressures are from bathroom fans, range hoods, and dryer exhausts. We actually create these pressures on purpose, and we do it for two reasons. One is to remove specific pollutants from a space, and the other is to encourage air change with the exterior. This is called exhaust-only ventilation. And it works by using some kind of fan to exhaust air from a space, which causes the space to become negatively pressurized, which in turn causes infiltration through defects in the air control layer to compensate for the air being exhausted by the fan. Air out equals air in. So if we use a fan to exhaust X amount of air from a space, we know that the same amount of air will infiltrate the interior somewhere. Now, the point of this discussion isn't to comprehensively cover this topic, including all of the problems with exhaust-only ventilation and the alternatives to it, but even in just explaining this concept, it's hard not to identify some pretty obvious ways where this might lead us into some trouble, right? But let's first close the loop on our original goal here of differentiating between mechanical conditioning and mechanical ventilation. Mechanical conditioning is what we get with our air handler in our baseline building. It's our temperature control, and it's the closed system we discussed. There's no exchanging air between the inside and the outside. Mechanical ventilation does involve exchanging air between the inside and the outside. And the graphic I'm showing you represents exhaust-only ventilation, which is the most common approach in North American residential new construction. We use a fan to get some air from the inside out, and we know that when we do this, we'll cause um, an equal amount of outside air to come in. This kind of exhaust-only ventilation is usually accomplished with bathroom fans, range hoods, and dryer exhausts. And the way we get fresh air into the building is by removing existing air, inducing a negative pressure, and causing infiltration. Sometimes this stuff is timed out. We can set bathroom fans to operate on a schedule, but often we just count on occupants using their appliances whenever and assume that things will be okay. We also count on air exchange from wind and stack pressures through defects in the enclosure. Is this maybe surprising to you? This was a really big aha moment for me. I think a lot of people see their supply and return vents and just sort of assume that there's some kind of provision for fresh air that's being made by someone somewhere. And there isn't. Air exchange between the inside air and outside air is happening passively from wind and stack pressures and from whatever unpredictable way you use your bathroom fans and kitchen range hoods. And that air, by the way, is being filtered through your walls and your ceilings. That's what we're breathing. And all of this is completely code compliant. We build new houses, even very expensive ones, to this standard. The mechanical system provides temperature control only, and we have some fans that exhaust air on some kind of schedule for ventilation. You can also see how, with a system like this, simply increasing the ventilation rate, which is to say exhausting more air from the building, doesn't necessarily give us a more comfortable or a more healthy interior environment. And in fact, it's why increasing the ventilation rate can actually make things worse by making homes dangerously humid, uncomfortably dry, or even introducing new pollutants into the enclosure. If there's anything in our profession that I hope really changes over the next 10 years, it's this.